is Go Beyond, the teaching and preaching ministry with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, please come and visit us. Let's now join in with the Judah Ministries praise team at the Worship Center.
trust you completely, God. We lean fully on you. How we need you. How we need you. Come on, you want. How we desperately need you. Oh, we trust and know and believe that you're perfect. You're perfect. Oh, you're perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To Well, praise God, everybody. Listen, we are continuing with our study of the book of Revelation. So if you want to go ahead, we'll get there in a few minutes, but we're going to work our way through the entire chapter of Revelation chapter 1 this morning. So you could go ahead and open your Bibles or your electronic devices in Revelation chapter 1. So last week, we took a look at the entire, or not last week, last message, I should say, we took a look at the entire book of Revelation in an overview. So this week, we're going to begin our dissecting of this uh, incredible book. Now, while the book of Revelation, it's filled with disaster, it's filled with terror, unimaginable destruction of the earth and the people in it at that time, Right? Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the last days. The good news is, as I read it, that we, the church, are not present in the earth at the time of God's judgment. Somebody can go ahead and just say, thank you, Jesus, right there. However, right, this is a time, instead of a boat ride like Noah got, we're getting free airfare, somebody. Mm. Now, some of you get that like next week sometime. But. So 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3, I'm just going to read this to you. It says, destruction will come upon them. Somebody say them. That does not mean us. Thank you. Destruction will come upon them. And then in verse 9 in that same chapter and verse, it says, for God has not appointed us, somebody say us. He has not appointed us to suffer wrath. Yes, Jesus. Now it's my belief that I, as I study the word of God, I believe that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture, meaning that the church of Jesus Christ will be snatched away, harpazo in the Greek prior to the seven-year tribulation period. Now, I'm not alone in this doctrinal stance, as there are many theologians, there are many biblical scholars from a wide spectrum of well-known teachers, from John MacArthur, David Jeremiah, Perry Stone, John Hagee, I could go on and on and on and on, and many, many others, so I'm uh, far from being alone in this stance of a pre-tribulation rapture. So, uh, this is not some kind of solo revelation or solo theology. Y'all with me? Say amen. amen. However, there are some that believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, and a few believe in a post-tribulation rapture, which I kind of call that the U-turn theology. You know, you go up and then come right back down with Jesus. You know, it's like U-turn Theology. Now, some even believe that there is no rapture at all. There are Christians that believe that, and I believe that that is great error in the Word of God. 
So before we get started in Revelation chapter 1, just let me give you a couple of reasons for my pre-tribulation stance. Number one, many who believe in a uh, mid-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture believe that the Lord will use this seven-year period to cleanse his church so that we will be without spot or wrinkle. Honey, listen. The day that Jesus called you, hmm, the day that you said yes to Jesus, the Bible says that you were justified. So at that moment, you were washed with the blood, so now you are positionally spotless, and God the Father sprayed you with some Holy Ghost starch and pressed you, so you are now without wrinkle as well. So listen, positionally, you are straight out of the dry cleaners, ready to take flight. Come on, somebody give them a high. Also, listen, no matter how much persecution we suffer, church, we will never, somebody say never, never. we will never reach perfer uh, perfection in this earthen vessel. I don't care what we go through. We will never reach perfection in this earthen vessel. Even if we use Paul as our standard, the great apostle who said that out of all the sinners, I am the worst. That's Paul. How far behind are we from him? However, the day will come when we will exchange this body for a glorified body. I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? Hmm? <laughs> Secondly, we are considered the bride of Christ since we drank the cup of the covenant with him. Yeah. However, we are waiting for the father to tell his son, go get your bride. Now, I taught on this in the Feast of Trumpets, I believe, back when we talked about the festivals. So you can go watch that video on YouTube. The bridegroom will snatch us away, just like in Matthew chapter 25, and take us to the wedding chamber and consummate the marriage and spend our seven days of awe with our bridegroom. Now, I cannot imagine, this is just me, the bridegroom looking at us, his bride, and saying to himself, hmm, I think I need to put my bride to be through hell on earth to cleanse her and to prepare her for our wedding night. I don't know. I don't, I don't see that. I, 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 I just don't, I don't see that. Now, some mid-trip teachers, and I have many friends that are mid-tribulation believers, so but we agree on the important things that the virgin birth and, you know, Jesus' is blood, Jesus is the only way. But, you know, so we have some differences, but that's okay. But many of them say that the danger in teaching pre-trib rapture is that the church will be unprepared should we go through the tribulation period. Not so. Because if one is teaching the whole counsel of God. If somebody is teaching grace and mercy, but yet they're teaching judgment and a day of reckoning before God, the under shepherd should be preparing the sheep to be ready for whatever comes along and whenever it comes, be it now or during the tribulation period. Because somebody could just say amen there. Reason number three. And I could give you a lot more, but I'm going to finish with this one. Is because as I read my Bible in Revelation, 22 chapters in that book, the church is not even mentioned between chapters 5 through 18 while God's judgment is taking place on the earth. The church returns with Jesus in chapter 19 right alongside with Christ, and then we reign with him forever. So listen, Judah, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Can I have an amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for this day. We bless your name. We thank you for your word. 
Father, we ask today, Father God, that you would open up the ears of our understanding, Father God, that we would hear your Holy Spirit teach us, because you are the great teacher. So, Father, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody says amen. 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 So we're at Revelation chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. The Bible says the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So I'm blessed this morning because I'm reading it aloud. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. Are you taking it to heart this morning? The Bible says you're blessed because the time is near. This book or this writing from the Apostle John is one revelation, hence the name of the book, Revelation. It's not plural. There's not several revelations within the book of Revelation. It is a book of the revelation or the apocalypse or the revealing of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings. It's revealing Christ as the Lord of Lords. It's revealing Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It's revealing Jesus as the Lamb who is the only one who is worthy to open the scroll. It's revealing Jesus in all his glory, all his power, all his might, a mighty warrior who will defeat the devil once and for all. Come on, somebody. There's no other book in the Bible that details the magnificent glory and the splendor of our God and his son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. The book also gives us a few glimpses of heaven and also details events preceding and surrounding the second coming of Jesus Christ, not to be confused with the rapture. A lot of people misunderstand that. There are two events. There's the rapture of the church, which we disappear, and then there's the second coming of Jesus Christ, where we read in Revelation 19. So those are two completely separate events. Now, sometimes you'll read, especially in the Old Testament, and you'll read it in the New Testament as well, when the Bible talks about the Day of the Lord, capital D. How many of you are familiar with that? The Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord is not a day. It's a period of time. So when the prophets in the Day of the Lord, my spirit will be poured out. He's speaking of a period of time. Is everybody with me? Say amen. So, the other thing is, is when we're talking about the prophetic book, there are five, this is just an FYI, there are five times more prophecies of Jesus' second return, second coming, the second advent, as there was his first. Now, how many of you know Jesus fulfilled the first advent? He was here. Honey, hear me when I tell you. He's coming again. He's coming again. Jesus promised he would return. The angel said in the book of Acts 1 and 11 that the same way you saw Jesus ascend is the same way you'll see him descend. He's going to come out of the sky, somebody. Jesus said himself in John 14, if you could put that up, 1 through 4, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Great. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Hmm. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. But then, you know, Thomas pops off and says, we don't know the way, Lord. You didn't give us a, a map. We don't have a, a GPS uh, system. Baby, listen to me. You don't need a GPS system. You just need to know the way. 
And the way has a name. Oh, come on, somebody. The way's name is Jesus. Listen, saints of God, the return of Jesus Christ to take his church, to take his bride out of this world and the pouring out of the judgments on this earth as revealed in the Revelation is not some fictional sci-fi story for Hollywood to just to go ahead and make a movie out of it. Come on, somebody. Even in some areas of Christendom, they proclaim that this is allegory. Please know there's a big difference between preaching the Bible and preaching some babble. Mm. The rapture of the church is not some fairy tale. It's not allegorical. Some say the word rapture is not even in the Bible, pastor. So how could there be a rapture? The word isn't even in the Bible, all right? Well, did you know uh, the word trinity? isn't in the Bible either. So does that mean that God doesn't exist in three persons, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Of course not. We know that there is a trinity, even though the word is not written in this Bible. Did you know in the entire book of Esther, God is not mentioned one time, but yet he's found on every single page in that book if you read it. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to help somebody here. Watch, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 says this. For the Lord himself, himself, he isn't sending an underling, he isn't sending some seraphim, he isn't sending the cherubim, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and he will come down from heaven with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What does that mean? Let me break that down for you. That means when that trumpet sounds, bodies are going to be coming up out of the graves. Those loved ones who are in mausoleums, they're going to make their way out. Those ones who lost their life at sea somewhere, they're going to come, oh, come on, somebody. They're going to come on up out of the ocean. The Bible says after that takes place, watch verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be harpazo will be raptured, will be caught up together with them. In other words, I'm trying to tell somebody there's going to be a great family reunion in the air. Where's this going to happen? Watch. We're going to gather with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, listen to me. If this kind of preaching doesn't give you some kind of hope of seeing your saved loved ones on the other side, I don't know what will. Pastor, how's that going to happen? How's that going to happen? You know, I, I haven't been to the gym in a while, and I'm a bit out of shape. Uh, I can't get more than three inches off the ground. Anybody with me here? I, I don't think I can get more than three inches off the ground. So how am I going to reach them in the clouds? Listen, I don't know. But then again, I don't know how the Red Sea parted. I don't know how the sun stood still. I don't know how three boys were thrown into a fiery furnace and came out and didn't even smell like smoke, huh? I don't know how a guy got swallowed by a fish, got spit up on a shore, preached to an entire city, and the entire city got to. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how it happened in one day in 1948 that Israel became a nation again. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how it happened when Jesus come up out of the grave. All as I know is the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Come on, somebody, if you're with me. Let's, let's read that passage some more. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18. Watch. After that, they come up out of the grave. We who are still alive are left. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Watch. And so we will be with the Lord for how long? Come on. You, you didn't convince me. I know you ain't convincing no devil. How long are we going to be there? We're going to be there forever. 
Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, be encouraged. Let's get back to the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 4. It says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is faith, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So here in verses 4 and 5, we see the trinity of our God. We see our triune God right in these couple of verses. It says, God the Father, who is, who was, and is to come. In other words, he's eternally existing. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He is uh, from be, uh without beginning, without end. The Bible says, and the seven spirits. This is a reference to the fullness of the Holy Spirit as described in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. If you could put that scripture up for me, please. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord, number one, will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, number two. The spirit of understanding, number three. The spirit of counsel, number four. The spirit of might, number five. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, six and seven. So this is the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. So when you read in the book of Revelation, it says the seven spirits of God. How many of you know there's one Holy Spirit? These are just the seven attributes or the fullness of of the Holy Spirit. So we have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and then we have God the Son, because then it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, firstborn of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20, if you could put that up, please. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In the Lord's celebration of first fruits, and once again, you could go refer back to the Feast of the Lord if you want to on the YouTube channel. When, you talk, when we talk about the Feast of First Fruits, whatever happened to the first fruits happens to the rest of the crop that follows. So, whatever happened to Jesus, him being the first fruits, he rose up from the grave. Amen. Somebody should just go happy right there. Because that means one day that we're going to raise up from the grave as well. Because we're part of that first fruit, somebody. Yeah. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. Watch, it says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be all glory all power forever and ever. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, we're talking about Jesus. Verse 7, it says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. And everybody said amen. amen. We're still talking about Jesus, church. Watch, verse 8, I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God. Now who's talking here? This is Jesus talking. Is everybody following me? Come on, connect some dots here. All right, I am, Jesus is saying, the Alpha and the Omega. Who is, who was, who is to come. The Almighty, meaning unrestricted power, exercising absolute dominion and authority. And everybody who's looking for that day shouts amen. Now, the first time that Jesus came, he came as a lamb with mercy, grace, and forgiveness. The second time, he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah with fire in his eyes. He's coming as the conquering king that he is. He won't be coming with grace and mercy. The next time, but the next time, he's coming with a sword, which will be his word. He's coming with judgment. That's why at the second coming, the Bible says the entire earth mourns because they will be looking for some shelter they're going to be looking for a place to hide but the bible says they will not find a place to hide from his judgment 
In that day, there will be no place to hide. There will be no gray areas. Sin will be called sin. Mm. Honey, what you feel won't matter any longer. There will be no more coexist. Oh, I'm just trying to help somebody here. There will be no more chrislam. There will be no more ecumenicalism, uh, ecumenicalism with everyone sitting around singing kumbaya or uh, what, what's that John Lennon song? Imagine all the people. You will not weasel your way out of impending judgment. There will be no double talk or the redefining of terminologies. On that day, everybody will come to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth and the life. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Everybody will come to that knowledge that day. And thank God, He is the one who loves us. He is the one who has freed us by His blood. And it's by His blood that we are made to be a kingdom and priest to serve Him forever and ever. Come on, somebody give the Lord a big praise in His house. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. Revelation chapter 1. Beginning with verse 9, it says, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, verse 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a, a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his, out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Now, John was relegated to the Isle of Patmos for his preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church tradition says that they tried to boil him in oil to kill him, but he didn't die. So they relegated him to the Isle of Patmos, and this is where he received his revelation. Sometimes, church, listen, we need to be set apart that we might hear from God. Mm. Sometimes we need to be placed in an uncomfortable situation where he is the only one we can depend on. I could give you a whole bunch of examples through the Bible, speaking of David, Moses, Daniel, Noah, Jonah. We could go on and on and on. Sometimes God needs to isolate us from all other distraction so that he can get through all the static in our lives. Because sometimes we're just not willing to turn that TV off, are we? Uh, we're not willing to set that phone down to get away from Facebook for five minutes. Hmm? We can't put Snapchat or Instagram away for a few minutes so we can say, Lord, speak to me. Sometimes he has to take us to an Isle of Patmos. Listen, this is to everybody in this place. If you're born again, God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has a revelation for you. 
Father is trying to speak to us. He has a calling on your life. He has a mission for you to fulfill, and he will not give up until he gets through to you. Are you hearing him? Your spiritual assignment, listen to me, is not just to show up at church on a Sunday morning and fill a pew. Mm. So the Bible says that John heard a voice like a trumpet. In other words, it was very distinct. You do not mistake the sound of a trumpet. So there is no uh, question as to who is speaking to John. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verses 12 and 13, it begins to describe the risen Christ. John sees seven lampstands uh, around him, and which are later described as the seven churches with the Son of Man dressed in a robe with a golden sash. The garments that Jesus is wearing depicts him as a priest and as a judge among his churches. Watch, let's confirm that with some other scriptures. I need Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2 up there. It says, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary. So Jesus is our high priest serving us right now in the midst of his church and making intercession for us. Every high priest always had to have something to offer and Jesus offered his own blood. My God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says this. He entered the most holy place once for all in other words he's not going to do it again once for all by his own blood thus obtaining eternal redemption he's also depicted as judge and he is the final judge second timothy four and one it says in the presence of god and of jesus christ watch who will judge the living and the dead listen to me somebody jesus will judge verse 14 the bible says his hair is white like snow or white like wool this speaks of his purity and his perfect wisdom and his eyes like fire they speak of his piercing and penetrating holiness the day that we stand before jesus listen to me somebody he will look right through us he will look right through you There will be no sidestepping. There will be no excuses. There will be no semantics or, uh, Lord, I really thought you said this. No, 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 honey. Listen, there will be no confusion to us when he spoke to our hearts. So I want to encourage somebody today. What the Lord has spoken to your heart. Do not disregard the voice of the Lord. Do not harden your heart before the Lord God Almighty. Because one day we will stand before him. And he will have eyes like fire. So I'm trying to encourage you to do what God has called you to do and stop doing come on stop doing what he's asked you to stop doing first corinthians 3 and 13 watch it says their work whose work say my work one two say my work this is our works will be shown For what it is, here's that capital D I was talking about, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with the fire of his eyes, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Listen, Judah, nothing will get past our God, be it good, bad, or the ugly. Verse 15 says, his feet... Like bronze speaks of his walking through trials and his limitation as a son of man. In other words, he, Jesus, being all God and all man, therefore qualifying him to be the perfect sacrifice. Then his voice 
sound like uh, rushing waters. In other words, when we stand before God, you will not talk back to the Son of God. You might talk back to your mama. You might talk back to your daddy. You might talk back to your spouse, but hear me when I tell you, you will not talk back to Jesus Christ. Your sassy mouth will cease. When he's looking at you, listen, your days of mm, 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 are over. You will not shout him down. To give you an example of this, if you ever been to Niagara Falls and you heard the thunder, go ahead and try to shout that thunder down. Ain't happening. Ain't happening. You will not plead your case or overtalk him. You will have no excuse. You will only be able to bow down. You will only be able to bow down at his feet. Yeah. You will only be able to get prostrate, prostrate before him. And hopefully you will hear, well done, yeah. my good and faithful servant. Come on, somebody praise God in the house. Verse 16 says, the seven stars in his right hand speak of him holding the seven churches with authority because it's in his right hand, meaning authority. And from his mouth is a double-edged sword which declares the severity of his word by which he will judge. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, if I could have that up there, please. Verses 12 and 13 says, watch. For the word of God is alive, it's active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So listen, listen. As Christians... As born again, spirit-filled believers, our sin is already judged. Come on, somebody give God a praise right there. Thank God our sin is judged. However, we will stand before Christ and give an account for everything that we've done and that everything that has been entrusted to us. So what kind of stewards are we? How did we manage our time? How we, are we managing our finances and our families, our marriages, our ministries, the callings that he has in our lives? How are we managing the giftings and the talents that he's given each and every person in the body of Christ? Listen, somebody, you are saved to serve. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. It's time to get up off your assets and get involved into the kingdom of God. Church, we will be held accountable. Now, if this doesn't stir you to want to get involved in kingdom work, I don't know what will. Then it says his face was shining like the sun in all its brilliance. In other words, it's his glory. There's nothing hidden in the light. Everything will be pure, holy, and true. All right, let's finish this up. Verse 17. When I saw him, John speaking, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Verse 19, write therefore 
what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So first off, John writes, when he saw Jesus, he fell as a dead man. In other words, he was immediately slain in the spirit, kind of like Isaiah in chapter 6 when he said, woe is me in the presence of God. Or like the priest in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, when the glory of the Lord fell, the Bible says that they could not even stand to minister for the glory of the Lord. The presence of God just caused them to fall to the ground. They were just overwhelmed by his presence. So just to be in the glory of his presence causes one to fall in complete humility, in complete reverence, just in awe. In other words, when we stand before him, church, we are going to be in utter speechlessness. Utter speechlessness. Then Jesus placed his right hand on him. I love this. And he said, fear not. Fear not. He said, I hold the keys of death and Hades. Keys represent authority or access. And it is Jesus, it's Christ alone that holds the keys. Nobody else holds the keys. Hades is a holding place where the spirits of the unbelievers remain until the time of the final judgment found in Revelation chapter 20. Listen to me though somebody, especially somebody watching by this broadcast. Listen, Hades is not purgatory. Nobody will pray you out of that place. Nobody will light candles and get you out of that place called Hades. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many masses or services you have in the honor of whomever. You will not have enough to get them out of there. I don't care if you start a Facebook GoFundMe account. I don't care how much money you raise. You're not getting them out of there. Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to call on Jesus Christ. Jesus gives us an example with Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16. Take some time. Please go read that. You will not get out of that place. You will be completely aware of your surroundings. The Bible details that in Luke 16. When Lazarus, the rich man, he's in torment. He says, hey, go tell my brothers not to come here. He had his mind about him. He knew what was still going on on the other side. Come on, somebody. The Lord said there's a great chasm. He said they had the prophets. They didn't listen. But then the rich man says, well, you, you know, listen, if they see Lazarus rise from the dead, maybe they'll believe. Listen to me. Jesus Christ already rose from the dead. If you don't believe because of that, honey, I can't help you. That's why we need to preach the unadulterated truth. We've been called to be the salt of the earth, not the sugar of the earth. We haven't been called to sweeten things up while people are busting the gates of hell wide open. My God. Mm. Revelation. 
Chapter 20, verse 14. So let me read this to you it's on the screen. It says, Then death and Hades, all those who are in Hades, are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Is somebody hearing this message this morning? This is not allegorical as some well-known preachers are starting to preach that there is not a literal hell. I'm here to tell somebody hell is a literal place. And it's interpreted that way in other parts of the Bible. We don't have time today to go through that. So the Bible speaks about a second death. So if you're born twice, you will die once. However, if you're only born once, you will die twice at the second death and end up in the lake of fire. Lastly, Jesus tells John to write down what is going to take place now and later. In other words, write down, because these things are happening currently, it's going right now, but there's things that are going to take 2,000 years before they happen. So he tells them the right things down that are going to take now, take place now and later. Now the book of Revelation is unique in that it is constantly moving from history to current events during John's time as well into the future as well as it moves from the natural things on earth to the supernatural things in heaven. So when studying this book, you must take all of these things into consideration. Is this speaking of history or the future or both? Is this history going to repeat itself? So that's part of the challenge as you study the book of Revelation because it's constantly moving. History, past, spiritual in the world. It's always moving. Then he gives John some insight. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. The seven stars are the seven angels over the churches. So just for clarification, the word angel used here in the Greek is agalos, which can mean a supernatural being, but it also can be used as a church leader, as it's also used in other parts of the Bible, speaking of elders or church leaders or pastors. In other words, uh, you know, we, we use the word hot, such as, wow, you ha really have a hot car or it's really hot outside. Depending on the context is how we interpret the word hot. Word hot. Is everybody with me? So when you, there are not seven angels over seven churches. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever speak about an angel being over a church. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, so next message, we will begin to see what Jesus says to the seven churches and its leaders. But for today, how many of you are glad that you serve a risen Savior who is the King of kings, Lord of lords, was dead and is alive forevermore, and now you're headed to glory? Come on, put your hands together and give him a praise in his house. to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ.